Thank you all for joining us for optimizing early breast cancer outcomes in a community setting, an expert review of emerging therapies and evolving standards of care in HR positive, HER2 negative disease. This is presented by Creative Educational Concepts and supported through an independent educational grant from Lilly. Throughout the presentation, we will be using some of the features of Zoom. I will be sending you the general information, the handout, and also the polls. If you have any questions, we can use the chat box or the Q&A box. Today, I have Dr. Rugo with us. And since we're on a tight timeline, I'm gonna turn it over to her and everything else you need for this presentation will be found in the information passed on to you. Thank you. Hello and uh, good morning, I think for pretty much everybody or good beginning of good afternoon. Uh, welcome to this, um, I think very nice uh, talk on uh, trying to apply emerging data as well as established data to clinical practice. I'm really looking forward to talking to you today and hearing from you about how you would apply this data to clinical practice. I'm Hope Rugo at the University of California, San Francisco's Comprehensive Cancer Center, where I'm a breast cancer oncologist and clinical trialist. Um, these are all of the disclosures of the different staff that are involved in uh, this uh, program. There are different presenters who have worked across the United States on these programs, the peer review and CEC staff. Uh, Creative Educational Concepts works on CME education, and this is supported by an independent educational grant from Lilly, uh, but the slides were uh, developed independently by the faculty in this program, um, along with the tremendous staff from Creative Educational Concepts. It's accredited for one uh, AMA PRA uh, Category 1 credit, and for pharmacists, one ACPE contact hour, and for nurses, one contact hour. And to obtain credit, a link appears at the end of the webinar. Click on the link to complete the evaluation, which you need. It's higher risk. It's also identifying predictive factors. So we're going to look at the current landscape um, in patients with this subtype, including established and emergent, emerging uh, evidence that for novel therapies in the adjuvant setting, the consensus guidelines and FDA approved indications. And we also, of course, as always, want to understand treatment related adverse events with oral therapies and how we can mitigate the toxicity as well as improve adherence. We're going to use real-world patient case examples to design on-label treatment plans for patients at a high risk of recurrence, emphasizing how we can communicate best with our patients and coordinate with our multidisciplinary community-based teams, and then evaluate adaptive approaches for the most important factor of all of this with oral therapy, which is promoting adherence and persistence to oral anti-cancer therapies, understanding the reasons for non-compliance and the impact of patient counseling and shared decision-making. So we're gonna start with a pretest. So you're gonna be doing these um, Zoom <laughs> polls as we go along. Uh, so we'll get used to them here. So all of the following are true about HR positive, HER2 negative, early breast cancer, uh, except the following. It's the most common breast cancer subtype. Five-year relative survival for regional disease is about 90%. Single agent chemo has long been the backbone for adjuvant chemo and recurrence is a key consideration for adjuvant treatment selection. So vote, it will help us get through things. Uh, don't worry too much about your voting, just uh, quickly vote. Okay, so we have um, uh, about 25 out of, there's 40 on, but some of course are staff, but 25 people have voted and um, the the question is weird because it's like everything is true except, um, and actually HR positive uh, HER2 negative disease is the most common subtype. I don't know that the um, correct results are um, highlighted here. No, we'll uh, discuss that at the end. Yeah, okay. So we'll go through them, but it is interesting. I mean, it, this is a funny question because it's except, right? Um, so you know, the, these are the, you, what you're really picking up is what has not been 
uh, the case. So we got the most votes for HR positive disease, which it, of course is the most common subtype and single agent chemo has long been the backbone of adjuvant therapy. We know it's combination therapy. So um, that, that uh, you know, we'll, we'll talk about this a little bit more as we get uh, uh, on. Um, okay, so now let's go on to the stop sharing. Okay, so now I've got to hide this, sorry. Just trying to, it, it actually, the little pole goes up and sits in the middle of my screen, which I have to have it not do. All right. So now we're going to go on to the next one. Uh, based on the results from the Monarch E trial, um, a bemaciclib, a CDK4-6 inhibitor, was FDA approved in combination with endocrine therapy for adjuvant treatment of HR positive, HER2 negative, node positive early breast cancer at high risk of recurrence with the FDA took out of the study as being specifically a key 67 of 20% or greater. According to NCCN and ASCO consensus guidelines, what factors uh, make a patient high risk? So more than two nodes, four or more nodes, one to three nodes, and grade three histology, a tumor or a tumor size of five centimeter or a key 67 of greater, 20% or greater, or B and C. Okay. Oh, we're getting even more votes. Very exciting. So 78% said B and C. So we'll see when we get to the end uh, where we are with this. Okay. Um, and then which of the following toxicities associated with oral therapies in HR positive HER2 negative early breast cancer is correctly matched to the recommended management strategy? So patients taking uh, abemaciclib 150 twice a day in combination with tamoxifen and develops grade three uh, neutropenia that's recurrent, hold until grade two or less, and then resume at 100 BID. The patient is taking a BEMA 150 BID, develops grade three diarrhea, hold until grade one or less, and resume at 50 milligrams twice a day. The patient is taking Olaparib 300 twice a day and can't tolerate due to stomach upset, reduced to 150 BID. The patient is taking a lap rib at 300 and is experiencing fatigue that's impacting quality of life. This is to be expected. No clinical intervention is necessary. So people are voting. There's less certainty here I can see because the votes are coming in a little more slowly. <laughs> Just pick one, <laughs> would be my thought. The one that fits into what you think the best. Okay, we had 22 answer this one. And the most common answer uh, was the abemaciclib dose reduction for grade three neutropenia um, and or the at 32%. Um, the dose reduction would, a, uh, I'll point out, going from 150 BID to 50 BID is never going to be the answer uh, because that's a big dose reduction, right? It comes in 100 milligrams too. So the next reduction after 300 is 200 in general, but we'll talk about this more. All right. Which of the following are recommended elements of the simple framework to promote patient adherence and persistence to oral oncolytic therapy? Simplify medication, education of patient and family, evaluate adherence at regular intervals throughout treatment or all of the above. <laughs> this one is not quite as tricky, <laughs> I would say. And definitely I didn't say before, there's a Q and A section which you can drop questions into and I'll see them because it gets highlighted and hopefully we'll have time to talk about them. Okay, did we end? Yes, okay, good. So out of 23, 91% said all of the above and evaluating adherence in a couple of people. So very good um, answers. All right, so now we're gonna talk about some cases. A 54 year old woman with a diagnosis of HR positive HER2 negative EBC. She also has grade three histology. It's stage 2B, meaning she has node positive disease and key 67 is 30%. 
She doesn't have any germline mutation. She has double mastectomies followed by TC chemotherapy and then starts letrozole. What additional therapeutic consideration should be made with respect to her medications? Stop letrozole and start adjuvant chemotherapy with dose dense AC. Start adjuvant to bemaciclib 150 BID along with letrozole. Start olaparib with letrozole. Nothing added. Letrozole monotherapy is the right choice. Remember, the patient does not have a germline mutation. All right. So uh, most people, 52% would use a bemaciclib, 28% olaparib, which we only use in patients with germline mutations in BRCA1 and 2, and PALB2, many of us, although it wasn't tested. Um, and uh, four people believe that this would be sufficient treatment. So let's see as we go along. So now let's talk about the first part, which is just our epidemiology and clinical features and how we stratify recurrence risk. Uh, the basics of early breast cancer, breast cancer is certainly the most common diagnosis of cancer in women worldwide, and it's the second most common cause of cancer death uh, in the world. Uh, estimated 288,000 cases in 2022 um, in the United States. Uh, and uh, the age adjusted rate is 87 new cases per 100,000 women. 68% uh, of breast cancer cases um, is HR positive disease. So you can see that this is by far the most common. You can see a little pie diagram over here from the SEER database um, that is contributed to by the American Cancer Society as well. Um, and if you look at the HER2 positive groups, it's kind of interesting. It's only 14% overall. So it really represents a small percentage of uh, patients in, uh, um, who have breast cancer. Um, and then if you look at the triple negative group, it's 10%. So these numbers are, you know, maybe a little bit different from what we would normally think. Um, I just wanted to highlight in the chat, the uh, handout PDF is attached. Um, so uh, the five-year relative survival percentages are listed by SEER. You know, so this is all epidemiologic data, but you can see that um, if you have uh, a, it's really remarkable now that 32% of patients with distant METs are still surviving at five years, which is a big improvement over what we had in the past, which was in the 20% range or less. Uh, for triple negative disease, you can see it's only 12%. Uh, but the outcome now in patients with early stage disease localized and regional is excellent, which is really great and uh, potentially the best numbers we've seen um, ever. Uh, I think in HER2 positive disease, obviously, we're going to see the highest survival at five years from uh, distant metastases. Uh, but I think it does highlight, you know, if we just go back here, if you look at HR positive, HER2 negative with regional, you know, 10% approximately of these patients relapse at uh, 10 at five years, but, you know, relapse continues. So at, you know, you've got only about half of your recurrence in the first five years. So you figure overall in the, at 20 years, it's going to be about 80%. So that means that a fifth of the patients will have recurrent disease. So we obviously want to optimize the treatment for these patients. So we're going to talk about three cases, a 42 year old premenopausal woman who has a grade three HR positive tumor. She has a germline BRCA mutation and she has stage 2A with a T1N1 tumor and a recurrence score of 26. Second patient is a 52-year-old postmenopausal woman, grade three again, HR positive, IDC. She's had a double mastectomy. She has a T2N1 tumor, stage 2B, a recurrence score of 35. She has type 2 diabetes, hypertension, and depression as her past medical history. And then the third case is a 66-year-old woman, postmenopausal, grade three IDC. HR positive has, again, although I have to say <laughs> in this group, there's too many mastectomies because you shouldn't have a mastectomy for these tumors, especially not this woman. You know, the BRCA mutation patient had a mastectomy because she had BRCA, but the other patients, it's, you know, this patient with a T1 tumor um, and N2, it doesn't help you to have mastectomies, right? For a small cancer, even if the nodes are positive. Anyway, we seem to be liking mastectomies in these cases. So she has uh, mastectomies and has a T1N2 tumor, um, and she has uh, 
hyperlipidemia and osteoarthritis as her past medical history. Okay, so our fundamental principles are that for some patients before surgery, and I would argue all but the smallest triple negative tumors and HER2 positive cancers, neoadjuvant therapy should be considered before surgery, breast conserving surgery or mastectomy, depending on personal risk as well as extent of disease. Um, and then adjuvant therapy, of course, can include uh, endocrine therapy, chemo and targeted therapies and radiation, of course, determined by multiple factors, uh, primarily the uh, clinical presentation before neoadjuvant therapy or at the time of surgery with uh, the extent of disease. I will point out that some patients with HR positive disease have very high risk cancers. Um, we've identified a group of patients who have mammoprint ultra high risk scores or basal-like intrinsic subtype, and those patients seem to have a very high rate of PCR with neoadjuvant chemotherapy. So we're working on identifying these patients with HR positive disease whose tumors act you know, more like uh, really triple negative cancers. Um, okay, so our old school was to look at tumor size, grade, and node involvement. Our new school is to look at these molecular prognostic indicators in HR positive disease and genomic predictors. And the combination of old and new really gives us the best information. I will say this particularly applies to HR positive HER2 negative disease. We know that the majority of triple negative cancers and HER2 positive cancers will benefit from chemotherapy and or targeted now targeted agents for both groups um, in, in uh, at least node positive disease and for HER2 positive disease, even node negative disease as well. Um, so it's a little bit different kettle of fish. So now we'll focus now on HR positive HER2 negative early breast cancer with the paradigms for treatment. Uh, and the use of chemotherapy really benefit depends on the risk of recurrence and biology of the disease. So it's not just risk-based. So having a lot of cancer doesn't mean that you're going to benefit from chemo ne necessarily. And we've used these gene expression tests, Oncotype DX and Mammoprint to help us uh, personalize therapy a little bit more. And the regimens that have been used include docetaxel and cyclophosphamide, um, dose-dense AC followed by weekly paclitaxel, or dose-dense AC followed by dose-dense paclitaxel. And I will say that in the neoadjuvant setting, uh, we use paclitaxel first, uh, followed by dose-dense AC. Um, and in patients with germline BRCA mutations, we've also used docetaxel and carboplatin. Endocrine therapy, of course, includes ovarian inhibitors and ovarian suppression in uh, premenopausal women, tamoxifen, and bisphosphonates uh, as a sort of an adjunct. And then novel and emerging therapies, CDK4-6 inhibitors, PARP inhibitors are now established in the early stage high-risk setting, and oral SIRDs are under evaluation. Um, so let's talk first about who needs chemotherapy. So this Taylor X, you know, was a large randomized phase three study uh, that evaluated patients who had node negative hormone receptor positive breast cancer using the Oncotype score to differ to um, stratify treatment. Uh, so patients who had a recurrent score of ten or lower received endocrine therapy alone. Uh, Twenty six or higher received endocrine therapy and chemotherapy of physician choice. And then the very large number of women, you can see that this was um, more than uh, 6,700 women um, were, who had a recurrent score of 11 to 25 were randomized to get endocrine therapy alone or endocrine therapy with chemo. They had to have a high risk node negative disease. So you couldn't have a T1A tumor, for example, you could have high risk T1B or TC, T1C or T2 disease, as long as you were node negative. It's a huge trial, 10,000 patients. Um, and what the study showed was that recurrence risk um, is, you know, we didn't look at node positive versus node negative here, uh, but what was found was in the node negative population that uh, if you were postmenopausal, a score of 25 or lower, you had no benefit from chemo. If you were under the age of 50, 50 or under, and similar data was shown in MindAC trial, uh, that there was a suggestion of possible chemo benefit in 16 to 25 score, but the risk of distant recurrence was only decreased in patients who had a score from 21 to 25. So I think that we then weigh the clinical pathologic factors and the individual patient um, in terms of whether we should use chemo between 16 and 25. I think 
it's very unclear. And so you really do have to weigh this benefit. Um, and I generally only consider chemo in a no negative, a patient with no negative disease if the score is 21 uh, to 25 based on the distant recurrence risk data that we have to date. Then we saw our expander. This trial now has uh, been published. The initial results and some updated data have been presented, but we still have a lot more follow-up that needs to be done. This uh, randomized patients who had hormone receptor positive early breast cancer with one to three positive nodes and a recurrence score up to 25, similar. Um, and they were uh, stratified by a recurrence score of zero to 13 or 14 to 25 based on Taylor X. And patients, uh, you know, as you can see, about 5,000 women received chemotherapy with endocrine therapy or endocrine therapy alone. And uh, what they saw was no benefit in any score for postmenopausal women giving chemotherapy in this group. Again, it's hard to know because there's probably a postmenopausal woman who benefits because you're looking at large groups here. But in the premenopausal women, surprisingly, uh, there was a benefit to chemotherapy regardless of score, and it didn't make any difference whether the score was 0 to 13 or 14 to 25. However, what was found out was only 17% of women treated on our expander received ovarian function suppression. Most of them received tamoxifen alone, although they clearly had a high-risk disease and soft and text have demonstrated survival benefit with more aggressive endocrine therapy with ovarian function suppression in an AI or even with OFS and tamoxifen in this group of women. So it's a little perplexing to me why, you know, 83% uh, of women received tamoxifen alone. Um, and we also, uh, Kevin Kalinske has shown in the analysis of this data set that uh, the women who received chemotherapy had more ovarian suppression from the chemo at two years compared to the women who got endocrine therapy alone. And they weren't even looking at estradiol levels. So I think that these results are very hard to interpret. I still very much individualize my decision making in women who are premenopausal, have one or two positive nodes and very low scores, and offer those women ovarian function suppression in an AI uh, with or without chemo, because I'm not, I just don't believe that uh, you know, the number of one to three positive nodes trumps everything we know about biology. And I think that this was a manifestation of ovarian function suppression. There is a trial that's opening within the NSABP, a lot of collaboration and really interesting work uh, looking at quality of life where patients will be randomized uh, to all have ovarian function suppression in an AI or TAM if not tolerated with the OFS and then chemo or not. So that will be a really important study, but you know we're not gonna see results for many years. So ASCO recommendation for the use of biomarker testing is to use Oncotype DX, PAM50, Mamaprint. I don't think most of us use PAM50 for node negative disease. For node positive, Mamaprint is recommended because of the data from MindDAC that suggested that uh, Mamaprint low risk score identified a group of patients with one to three positive nodes who didn't benefit from chemo. Um, the recommendations based on Taylor X are listed here. And we talked about that. My guideline for the uh, less than up to 50 years old starts at 21. Uh, but, you know, I think 16 to 20, you really have to uh, treat women who have higher risk no negative disease because the benefit of chemotherapy is going to be quite small. For premenopausal women who have uh, T1 to 3 uh, node negative tumors, um, this just gives you some information based on stage. Um, and if a tumor is less than or equal to 0.5 centimeters, don't send an oncotype if it's HR positive, because there's nothing that's going to make you uh, see benefit from chemotherapy for such a small tumor. It's not true, you know, if you have other high risk features like triple negative or HER2 positive, where there may be some situations where there's benefit. For patients who have a tumor is greater than 0.5 centimeters and are no negative, I would consider the 21 gene recurrence score. I will say if you have a you know, 75-year-old woman who has a 0.6 centimeter grade one tumor, ERPR 100%, you do not need an oncotype. Um, so you do have to always individualize this for the individual patient. Um, and this shows you, you know, the they lump together the 16 to 25 here, as we discussed earlier. I think ovarian function suppression for any high-risk disease is incredibly important. We don't know the optimal duration, but certainly, you know, I try and convince women to do at least three years. Um, and then the node positive tumors, again, you know, we talked about uh, the node N1 MIC and N1, they didn't see any difference there, although in uh, our expander, but there weren't very many patients who had um, the N1 MIC disease. 
But uh, if patients are not candidates for chemotherapy, obviously they might have medical problems, you're going to give endocrine therapy and ovarian function suppression. I think that the gene expression assays can help us by assessing prognosis um, and then potentially trying to help the patient understand the benefit of chemotherapy if they have one positive node or a micromet they're premenopausal and uh, you know very very low score disease. I might um, skip and recommend the ovarian function suppression, despite what our expander shows. It just it has to be individualized. Um, and then postmenopausal, of course, in scores under twenty five, regardless of most node status, you're going to give uh, the um, the endocrine therapy and no chemotherapy for high scores. You give chemotherapy. Uh, for more nodes, four or more nodes, you give chemo, although, you know, again, biology is there. And so it may be a small benefit for most women, but that's still our current guideline recommendation. You may, you know, have patients who don't have these tests done or don't want them done, Oncotype. I'm not sure why. In the United States, we're pretty much able to get them done. Um, in that situation, you know, if a patient has positive nodes, um, you really, it's harder to decide not to give adjuvant chemotherapy. Thankfully, in the United States, we generally have access to these tests. So now let's talk about these cases. AG is a 42-year-old premenopausal woman with a diagnosis of HR positive HER2 negative early stage breast cancer, grade three, with a germline BRCA2 mutation. She has a T1N1 tumor and her oncotype score is 26 and she's post-mastectomy. Now, I will say these are patients that I try and treat in the neoadjuvant setting. Um, if the tumor is node positive, I think you really gain a lot by treating before surgery. So after recovery from mastectomy, she presents to clinic to discuss her treatment. And we talked about this before. So which of the following is uh, this case? Adjuvant chemo is not recommended. Proceed to endocrine therapy. Adjuvant chemo with TC times four. Adjuvant chemo with dose dense AC times four, followed by paclitaxel dose dense or weekly, it doesn't matter. Um, adjuvant endocrine therapy following chemo would be recommended. So, which of the following is uh, recommended here? So, the questions throughout the presentation we won't actually vote on, it's just for discussion. Okay. Oh, all right, great, thanks. It looks the same, so I wasn't uh, wasn't quite clear when you had to vote or not. So the real question here is, you know, what do you uh, do? And I think it's really interesting. So this is a patient, just so that you all recall, she's got HR positive disease. She has germline BRCA2, and she has a score of 26, right? And node positive disease. So in this case, I don't think it's controversial that we would be giving chemotherapy, um, and it's not controversial that we would be giving endocrine therapy. So um, the to me, answer D is the appropriate answer. The chemotherapy that you choose is really up to you. I think in this situation, uh, with a high uh, oncotype score, many would recommend ACT. We generally give weekly paclitaxel. Um, and again, I think that using chemotherapy in the neoadjuvant setting uh, could be very helpful for patients like this because you may be able to tailor down the treatment intensity based on response to therapy. Whereas if you do surgery first, you really have no idea. Um, so now we have the second case, which is the 52-year-old postmenopausal woman who has a grade three T2N1 HR positive tumor. She has double mastectomies. She has some past medical history, hypertension, and uh, diabetes. And her oncotype score is quite high at 35. So you talk to her about TC versus dose dense AC chemo. Um, she then decides to, decides to proceed with dose dense AC. So I will say that her um, type two diabetes, depending on how bad it is and her hypertension on medications, increases her risk of cardiac toxicity from anthracyclines modestly. It really depends on how well her hypertension has been treated. Uh, and we don't uh, know which side her cancer is. If you were gonna have to do radiation, on the cardiac side, that might be also a consideration. So she proceeds with dose dense AC followed by paclitaxel, but she gets, um, she's, you know, she's worried. She has type two diabetes. She has a little underlying neuropathy and she's worried about more neuropathy. So which paclitaxel regimen would be better tolerated? So paclitaxel weekly for 12 weeks, paclitaxel every two weeks for four doses, paclitaxel every three weeks for four doses. She should not get paclitaxel, but get TC chemo instead. So the question is, what would you do in this situation to the audience? And I'm and love to see your comments in the chat or Q&A, whichever one you're able to do, um, to try and understand what her risk would be. I tend to give 
the uh, weekly for 12 weeks in patients who are at risk for neuropathy. And I actually recommend the cold gloves and booties and uh, emphasize the both protecting the hands with gloves. Uh, you put on these surgical gloves before you put on the cold glove because you want to protect your hands and feet from thermal injury, which I haven't seen with those recommendations. Uh, but also I talk about the fact that you need gloves that fit quite snugly in order for it to work because what you're doing is trying to delay it to reduce the circulation to the periphery of your fingertips and toes. And I have been amazed at how much better patients are doing since most of my patients use cold gloves and booties. They have to purchase them themselves. So it's a cost, which is a difficult uh, and they find their instructions online. But there's now uh, three different studies that have been reported, which have suggested that this approach reduces peripheral neuropathy. So in patients who start out with risk, you know, that's particularly important. And this is a lifelong toxicity that can be quite destructive for patients. So now let's talk about endocrine therapy for our patients. Now, the one last thing just to mention about TC is, you know, there has been data from the ABC trials as well as the um, West German Study Group trial uh, looking at uh, TC times six uh, versus uh, ACT and showing relatively equivalent outcomes. Uh, but when you get up to high node status and high risk status um, or non-HR positive disease, it does appear that the ACT regimen is clearly superior. Because we don't really have data with ACT versus TC and very high risk disease, it can be uh, very difficult to uh, differentiate um, you know, the, the benefit of these two regimens in uh, patients who have moderately high risk disease. So in some ways you just have to decide how high risk the disease is and what you wanna give. For like one positive node, I often give TC, uh, TC times six for patients who have low, uh, bi you know, low risk biology, but a lot of tumor burden where I'm gonna need to give chemo. So I really vary it, I'm trying to avoid AC when I can, but you know, we can give it and support patients well when we need it. So endocrine therapy, let's move on and talk about endocrine therapy. We have a number of different treatment options. So NCCN guidelines, you know, based on our randomized trials uh, from this year recommend uh, that if you're premenopausal diagnosis, you either get tamoxifen with or without ovarian suppression or an AI with or without ovarian suppression. Um, and then the uh, postmenopausal women, uh, AI for five years or tamoxifen to complete 10 years, premenopausal could complete 10 years of tamoxifen. It's a little confusing, those guidelines. I think the bottom line is that for higher risk disease, if you're premenopausal, you should receive ovarian function suppression with an AI preferably, and if not well tolerated tamoxifen. If you have low risk disease and you don't need any chemo, tamoxifen alone may be sufficient. If you're trying to avoid chemo, in a patient where you think the benefit is borderline, but the patient has higher risk disease, you need to use ovarian function suppression. What do we do with extending the duration of ovarian function, uh, of uh, endocrine therapy and assessing menopause? It can be very difficult to assess menopause because amenorrhea doesn't help us. And once you start the AI, their ovaries may kick back in again because it's providing this strong feedback to the ovaries. So you do have to watch very carefully and check estradiol if you're not sure about menopausal status when you use an AI. Even if somebody's been amenorrheic for five years, if they still fit into an age where they could have functional ovaries. Um, the, you know, we've seen benefit from AI and higher risk early stage disease extending after five years, either in patients who've received five years of an AI or in patients who've had a switching strategy with tamoxifen followed by an AI for the first five years and then continued the AI. Uh, overall, the data suggests anywhere from seven to 10 years benefits women in this setting. For postmenopausal women, the recommendations are almost identical, except for, of course, you don't have ovarian function suppression. Uh, there will be postmenopausal women where tamoxifen may be preferable to AIs, very small tumors with reasons not to tolerate AIs. Again, this should be individualized for the patient. In terms of the decision making of you know, how we decide who's lower risk or not, uh, you know, patients who have low intermediate risk and node negative disease, we generally give five years of an AI. If you start having positive nodes, so one to three positive nodes, we do extend out. There is no data in contrary to this uh, slide, even though the ESCO, they're just depicting the ASCO guidelines, that having four or more nodes is a differentiating factor versus 
uh, having one to three notes and giving seven versus 10 years of endocrine therapy. So I, we don't know what the right duration is. I think that, you know, patients who have very, very high risk disease, we do tend to use a, uh, um, uh, longer duration of endocrine therapy. So, you know, we will give, for example, 10 years for a patient who has 10 positive nodes because we know their risk of recurrence is very high. There's a lot of studies that are looking at trying to use oral surds in this setting to change the treatment so that we get a better feeling for, um, you know, I, I think the best outcome and a better feeling for what we can uh, do by changing therapy to overcome potentially acquired ESR1 mutations, et cetera. For premenopausal women, I mentioned that the data support ovarian function suppression, and there's a lot of uh, genomic assays that might help us uh, explore de-escalation strategies, so giving less therapy. As I mentioned earlier, this uh, trial that's actually will open soon from the NSABP that will look at uh, giving patients chemo or not with OFS AI. Uh, who have one to three positive nodes and recurrent scores up to 25. They also will evaluate this in patients who have higher risk node negative disease as one of the groups in the study. So really important trial. So now the 42 year old who has a diagnosis of HR positive, early stage breast cancer, grade three, and she has the germline BRCA mutation. So she actually had a T1N1 tumor, 1.5 centimeters, and her oncotype score is 26. She gets four cycles of TC. Now I will say for a patient like this, if she didn't want to get ACT, I would probably offer her docetaxel carbo, although there's not a lot of data there uh, because of uh, the issue that, um, you know, the BRCA mutation, which has DNA damaging defect, uh, might provide some sensitivity to platinum type agents. But again, I think you could use TC as well. She has anxiety and she also had a provoked venous thromboembolism after a long flight. So the question is what endocrine therapy regimen would you consider? Tamoxifen and astrazole, letrozole and ovarian suppression or tamoxifen and ovarian suppression. I tend to use gaserolin, but I think luprolide is fine. Uh, and then my choice of endocrine therapy for this patient would be an aromatase inhibitor, either letrozole or anastrozole, if she could tolerate it. She's gotten chemo already, so her ovaries are a little suppressed, which makes it easier for these women sometimes to tolerate continued ovarian function suppression. Uh, but the AIs can be tough. And if she doesn't tolerate the AI, I switched to tamoxifen after trying various aromatase inhibitors and interventions to try and manage toxicity. I do check the estradiol level. Um, at the end of each, uh, you know, when you're coming in to get each injection. And for very young women, I don't use the every three month dosing of the GnRH agonist. So now we have our 52 year old woman who has a T2N1 grade three tumor. Uh, she has had mastectomies and has diabetes and hypertension. She gets dose dense ACT and completes radiation. And now she comes for endocrine therapy discussion. So the question is uh, letrozole for five years or longer. Um, tamoxifen 2, exemestane 3, ovarian suppression for 5. So just to go back, she has T2N1 disease, right? So 1 to 3 positive nodes. So generally, we would recommend an aromatase inhibitor for at least 5 years. Um, we didn't talk about this earlier, but there are genomic tests like the breast cancer index that are being evaluated for longer than five years and have been shown to be prognostic and in a number of studies predictive in node positive disease about the benefit for longer duration aromatase inhibitor therapy. And so this can be considered as a way to make decisions in this patient population. Multidisciplinary momentum, we're talking about real world perspectives on novel therapeutics. So this is really a key area because we have so many new and emerging therapies, the CDK4-6 inhibitors and the PARP inhibitors already approved and the oral SIRDs uh, that are being evaluated. So there have been three randomized phase three trials in the early high risk stage setting, two trials with palbociclib, Pallas and Penelope B. Um, Penelope B was a small trial post-neoadjuvant, and a funny group of women where we know they have a higher risk of recurrence, uh, but it's a mixed group um, based on a, a scoring system to, uh, called CPG that just evaluates uh, the sort of risk based on a, the residual disease. Um, they only got one year of therapy, whereas two years in PALIS. PALIS included stage two node negative disease. Uh, so 
that was also an issue. Uh, there was no difference in four-year invasive disease-free survival in either trial. Um, but then we saw Monarch E, which is the third trial that reported. This was uh, giving a bemaciclib to more carefully defined women with high-risk early stage node positive disease. And then the Natalie trial, Monarch gave a bemaciclib for two years. The Natalie trial is giving ribociclib to high-risk early stage breast cancer for three years. So you can see that the numbers of women, you know, over uh, 5,600 women randomized. And we basically had uh, several criteria. So one criteria in a small group was node positive, one to three positive nodes, and a key 67 of 20% or greater. The other group included patients who had one to three positive nodes and didn't have the key 67 as the criteria. It had a tumor size of uh, five centimeters or greater and grade three histology. So the, you know, the two other risk factors. So interesting that you couldn't, if you had the high key 67, you couldn't have the other two risk factors. So that study showed a, a clinically important and significant improvement in both invasive as well as distant disease-free survival. Now with longer term follow-up with almost all patients off study therapy, uh, very impressive data in both the key 67 low and high disease, Although clearly the patients with high key 67 had a worse outcome with earlier risk of recurrence and a big benefit from adding abemaciclib. So this outlines this data a little bit more. So these patients had received up to 12 weeks of endocrine therapy. They were within 12 months of surgery uh, because you had to allow for therapy and radiation, et cetera. Um, you can see this four or more positive nodes or one to three nodes plus grade three or tumor size of five centimeters or greater. And then this cohort two, just with key 67, smaller group of patients, about 500 out of the total group of 5,600. They received two years of abema, um, but there was no placebo control with endocrine therapy or endocrine therapy alone. Here's the data with the improvement invasive disease free survival uh, now published in the Annals of Oncology. And we're going to see updated data from Monarch E at San Antonio this year as well. So that'll be exciting to see. Um, you can see that the um, absolute improvement I think is clinically relevant. Um, you know, you have a greater than 5% absolute improvement and a 30% relative risk reduction for an, uh, an invasive disease free survival event. The other nice thing to see is those curves are separating over time and patients were off the abemaciclib, of course, at 24 months where that first hatch line is. And then by key 67, you can see here the solid lines are the high key 67. They clearly have a worse outcome. And the dotted lines are the low key 67 where they have a better outcome, but both groups benefit significantly from the addition of abemaciclib. So the FDA approved in October of 21 at Bemaciclib now a whole year ago with endocrine therapy, and they decided high risk was node positive and a key 67 of 20% or greater. Um, and the reason why they did that was the overall survival is not mature. There are toxicities and they were not including cost. So just toxicities. So they said, we're going to pick out one group of patients from the entire study and not use the study criteria, which is kind of an odd thing. But the ASCO and NCCN guidelines, all of us, thought that we should really be following the Monarch E uh, eligibility criteria. So we actually broadened that to four or more nodes and one to three axillary nodes with one or more of the risk factors listed on this slide. And that's what all of us, I think, thought following clinical practice, and the insurers have been willing to follow this as well. So that's really encouraging. The starting dose is 150 milligrams twice daily. We don't use the monotherapy dose anymore. It is affected by uh, high acidity. So people are told to avoid grapefruit and grapefruit juice. Um, and if you eat the abemaciclib with a high fat meal, you can increase your exposure to the drug and therefore increase diarrhea. So there are tablets that go 50, 100, 150, and 200. In the clinical trial, the dose reduction went from 150 twice a day to 100 twice a day. I have sometimes used the uh, 250 milligram dose, so 150 in the morning and 100 at night, but the trial used 100 BID as the first dose uh, reduction. Uh, clinical monitoring, including uh, standard labs every two weeks for the first two months and then monthly for two months. Then as indicated, usually we continue with our monthly or every two or three month labs um, just to manage, make sure everything is okay, even every three months. Um, and then uh, magnesium, of course, should be uh, kept an eye on in patients with diarrhea. The adverse effects primarily are diarrhea, uh, but we also saw deep vein thrombosis, 
particularly if a bemaciclib was combined with tamoxifen. So we like to avoid that combination. Um, and also that could be associated with pulmonary embolism. And then uh, neutropenia can be seen as well. These patients are post their adjuvant chemo so and radiation. So sometimes they would be more sensitive to that. Uh, but we don't see a lot of neutropenia with a bemaciclib that needs managing in general. For hematologic toxicity, if patients have grade one or two neutropenia, we don't do anything standard with other chemo. Grade three, we withhold until toxicity resolves to grade two or less and restart. And I found that works really well. They get farther out from their radiation and chemo and they just do fine. If they have a second grade three or grade four, so less than a thousand or less than 500, you dose reduce after they recover to the next lowest dose. So if you were on 150 BID, you'd go to 100 BID. We don't give growth factors except for if people have serious toxicities or they're going to need surgery or something like that. And in that situation, we hold the drug for at least two days after the last growth factor dose to avoid sort of enhancing cell turnover with the growth factor and then cell death with the abemaciclib. Again, if you need a growth factor, you should dose reduce. Consider dose reducing to the next lower dose level when you restart. For GI toxicity, um, what's really important with GI toxicity with a bemaciclib, as it's the most common toxicity, is uh, education. It is so incredibly important. Women need to know that. I think there's a much greater awareness because of the data from Monarch E now than there was before. And uh, the idea idea is that no one should go home with a bemaciclib without having loperamide in their pocket. Um, and then we do tell people that the diet makes a really big difference. So they should avoid leafy green vegetables, raw vegetables, um, very spicy food in the first few you know, days and weeks after starting a bemaciclib when they're getting used to the diarrhea, because it really enhances the diarrhea if they go home and eat a big salad. Um, and then you can see that it, you know, grade one diarrhea is increase of less than four stools per day, four to six for grade two and greater or equal to seven uh, for grade three. And of course, grade four is life-threatening. Um, and if you have grade one, you know, you manage with the, trying to manage diet and giving more emodium. If you have grade two, you hold until they feel better. And then you uh, can start again at the same dose if patients can use, weren't taking enough emodium or something unusual happened, they got a viral syndrome or something like that. Um, if you have recurrent grade two, you want to dose reduce. Grade three, generally, we dose reduce for, um, you know, particularly if nothing unusual has happened and patients have been taking their anti-diarrheal medication. So um, this is a really important point and it helps maintain adherence. Other toxicities, you know, ILD, interstitial lung disease, we now know from TDXD, it's been reported with all three CDK4-6 inhibitors. You don't need to modify for grade one or two, uh, but, you know, if somebody has symptomatic grade two toxicity, um, I would uh, hold the drug and give steroids any symptoms. Um, you can start if it's low grade, you know, if grade two goes away right away, you could re-challenge. Um, for grade one, we don't do anything, but just keep an eye on it. We see it all the time. Grade three, you can't restart. Um, I think, you know, if somebody has really significant grade three, the guidelines here say you wait till it gets better with steroids, we usually treat, and then resume at the next lower dose. But I think you have to be very cautious in treating patients who have grade three or four ILD. This is something we rarely see and they're very sick. I would retreat with grade two that resolves to baseline. Again, this has to be individualized. When we looked at the uh, rate of discontinuation, uh, the factors that contributed, um, you can see here, uh, you know, why people discontinued. So the discontinuation rates are listed there. And, you know, it's interesting where more patients were enrolled, there was a little bit more discontinuation, premenopausal versus postmenopausal. So the premenopausal women, presumably, they were more worried and have higher risk disease, and they discontinued less, interestingly, than the postmenopausal women, 18%. They were sort of frustrated with disease. 65 years or older, 20, almost a 28% rate of discontinuation in those 430 women. Um, no difference in ECOG status or number of nodes. I think the big difference with number of nodes is that you see that, you know, there's a trend as you increase risk by having more nodes, there's less discontinuation, which makes sense. Um, and then comorbidities. If you have a lot of comorbidities, which were defined for this analysis, there's more discontinuation, double than having none, 18 versus not eight, in about 10%. 
The majority of patients who discontinued did so in the first six months, big fall off in the first three months due to diarrhea that wasn't well managed. And now that we have more education, I think it really makes a big difference in adherence. Okay. See if I can make a change. Okay. So dose reductions, very helpful. And you know, in clinical practice, you're not on a trial. You could dose reduce. It's great. I mean, you can just say, oh, we'll just dose reduce you 100 twice a day. If you don't tolerate it, you know, we can go down further. If you tolerate it and you feel better, we can always go back up again. And you can go to 150 and 100. So 250 milligrams. You have a lot of you know leeway here. Um, if you can't tolerate 50 twice a day, you should discontinue it. Uh, as I mentioned, education is really key. And it's incredibly important to have supportive care medications. We don't see a lot of nausea with the abemaciclib, but it's good for patients to have some nausea medication for rescue. And the loperamide dosing is incredibly important and calling in because you don't want them managing all this diarrhea at home and not calling in. So they got to know, take the loperamide and call us and hold your drug if you're having a lot of diarrhea, just in case they can't reach anybody or they're in, you know, without cell signal, who knows? So uh, this patient too, she uh, starts letrozole for five years and is given a bemaciclib. This is a patient who I think all of us would give a bemaciclib to. She has a T2N1 disease with a high score and a, a um, you know high risk disease. Um, so she does qualify for a bemaciclib. So she's gonna begin a bemaciclib. What's the following supportive care medication she should have access to at home? Loperamide, diphenhydramine, ondansetron, or bismuth subsalicylate. So I think all of us would agree here that loperamide is the right drug to have access to here. It's incredibly important. As I told you, they need to have it before they put that first pill in their mouth and to have done education. She begins it. Her ANC is 1200 after two weeks. What would you do? Grade one, continue a BEMA. Grade two, hold a BEMA. Grade two, continue a BEMA. Grade three, hold a BEMA. So a lot of this has to do with grading, but obviously you're going to continue the abemaciclib. It doesn't really matter which grade you call it, but it's uh, grade two. And uh, but in this case, you know, if your uh, neutrophil count is a thousand or higher, you continue and just watch the ANC. You don't need to make any other change. So what about promoting adherence to oral oncolytics? You know, understanding is so incredibly important. The regular administration, how to manage side effects. Um, you have to give them the tools to understand how to take their medications and why it's important. Direct questions about, are you taking your medication? How many times during the month were you unable to take the medication? Things that don't make them feel guilty, but help them share with you that information. Um, and your explanations need to be very clear and tailored to the level of patient education, their so-called health literacy and the therapeutic importance. So one of the things is, you know, I send a lot of my so-called survivorship patients to see my nurse practitioners on a regular basis and they help a lot. But sometimes when patients are really feeling very frustrated, they'll do an extra visit with me so that we can go over. And I usually show them graphics from recent published data. I found Taylor X and RX bonder curves are really helpful. And just try and tell them why the hormone therapy is so incredibly important for them and why we're giving them a bemaciclib and then work with the patients. There is uh, this very nice publication uh, from uh, summarized here. You can see the references at the bottom from 2020. that just talks about simplifying the regimen, imparting knowledge, modifying uh, patient beliefs, uh, patient and family communication, uh, trying not to take out the bias from our side versus theirs, um, and evaluating adherence. Um, we don't generally pill count, measure serum or urine levels, et cetera. Uh, but I think that it is uh, really, really helpful to ask patients about their adherence in the least threatening way possible it makes a big difference. Some people use medication event monitoring systems. Again, we don't generally do that in breast oncology. So she presents back, she's doing well, and she does tell you that she misses about four doses per week because she forgets the abemaciclib. So one question is, how can we help her? And um, I think, you know, one is identifying the barriers. Is it because she needs to rush to take her kids to school in the morning? Does she forget to take it at night? Um, a lot of times I'll look and see when patients last refilled their drug. That's very helpful too, both for these medications and narcotics. Um, is it, uh, it's usually not cost if you miss four pills a week. Is it side effects that bother them? I tell them to use a pill box. I also tell them to write it on their calendar because most people have smartphones now. They can put it on alarm if they're forgetting a lot and that makes a really big difference. There are even apps that help people send up a little reminder to say, did you take your pill? 
Um, so uh, case three, let's see if I can, I don't know that I'm my cursor. Well, let me look, let's see here. How do you stratify recurrence risk in your practice? Do you follow the FDA label O for abemaciclib? I follow the ASCO NCCN definition. You know, I will say that I'm a, I was a steering committee member on um, the Monarch E trial and published the toxicity management data uh, recently with Sarah Tulaney. And um, I really feel strongly that these are patients who are at high risk who benefit from Abema, so I don't follow the narrow uh, FDA guidelines, which none of us really could understand, even after talking to our friends in the in the FDA. So um, I th I just feel like you know these patients they recur, they fill up our clinics with recurrence, and if you can get them through two years of Abema Ciclib, there's clear benefit with longer follow up in Monarch E. Although I know the FDA tried hard to do a good job, so. Uh, here we have our third patient, the 66-year-old who has a grade 3 IDC um, and T1 and 2. So she's got a lot of nodes, four or more positive nodes. Um, she has hyperlipidemia and osteoarthritis. She gets four cycles of TC. I might have given her six, depending on how she would have done. I generally do for four or more positive nodes. She's going to go on a Nastrozol for five years and Zaledronate for three years. Um, the oncologist discusses a bemaciclip because she clearly fits into our uh, Monarch E recommendations for two years. Um, so uh, here you can see uh, what you would do she, when she comes in with diarrhea and abdominal pain. It's at one week, and this is very common. She's having five loose watery bowel movements per day, baseline of one, which of the following is correct. Hold abema for grade three, start tincture of opium. Grade two, hold abema, start loperamide. Grade two, continue abemaciclib, start loperamide. Grade one, continue abema, start loperamide. So this clearly is not grade one, right? And she has a baseline of one. You've increased by four, so she's grade two. Um, in this situation, I will usually have people, if they're not taking abemaciclib, uh, sorry, loperamide, I'll have them start loperamide and see how they do. I often will have them skip a dose or two, although I'm not holding it for a long time. If they're 65 and you know really having problems just because of the abdominal pain, not because of the diarrhea. Um, and then they get it under control and restart, and they usually do fine. We talk about their diet. We talk about using a sort of less um, roughage-like diet for the first few days after restarting. And then I have found all of my patients, with the exception of very few, who are taking a bemaciclib in the adjuvant setting, take at least a half an emodium uh, loperamide a day. So somewhere between one half to one. And then often when they eat a salad, they take another half or one. So managing it that way with prophylaxis to me works the absolute best rather than taking it in response to diarrhea because they just don't do well in that way. All right, now what about Olympia as we finish up here? We're gonna try and finish right exactly on the hour. So 1800 women who had germline BRCA mutations uh, were randomized to receive a laparib or placebo for one year and triple negative breast cancer, high risk, um, hormone receptor positive disease, no PCR, or this scoring system of greater than three or four uh, positive lymph nodes or more. Um, so that was a smaller group, uh, 325 patients with, it's interesting, most of them had BRCA1 mutations, most were triple negative. But when you looked at the subset analysis, patients benefited regardless of that, those differences. So three-year IDFS uh, was imp markedly improved. I mean, huge benefit. In the hormone receptor positive cohort, as I mentioned, there was still more than a 6% absolute benefit. In triple negative breast cancer, it was a little bit uh, greater, uh, just under 10%. But you can see these curves stay separated over time. And then overall survival was also improved based on the most recent data presented at ESMO um, in a uh, plenary um, earlier this year. Um, and you can see that in the hormone receptor positive group, the hazard ratio was 0.68, similar to the entire group. Um, and the uh, although the hazard ratio did cross one in the hormone receptor positive group because it's just too early. Uh, but the p-value was significant for the whole group and led to FDA approval for a laparib in any patient with high risk uh, breast cancer with a germline uh, mutation. The FDA approved this. You can see here high risk early stage breast cancer with neoadjuvant or adjuvant chemo. And the NCCN guidelines, four or more positive nodes, residual disease after pre-op therapy, or tumor grade um, high, uh, this CPS plus EG score of three or more. Um, the dose is 300 milligrams twice a day, it comes in 100 and 150, um, and the adverse effects are primarily anemia, but patients can get diarrhea, nausea, and vomiting. Um, and in Olympia, again, 
uh, the mostly it was low grade nausea um, uh, overall and uh, the as well as diarrhea and the primary issue, which was small, was anemia. Very few patients required um, uh, transfusions and taking the olaparib with food um, and taking antiemetics as needed work very well. And you reduce uh, down to 250 twice a day first if patients have GI toxicity from 300 twice a day. So uh, this patient who, uh, patient case one, we've gone back to oncotype score of six, BRCA2, completes four cycles of TC and radiation, starts an astrozole and GnRH agonist. She's had a venous thromboembolism. So uh, now we recommend that she would get uh, Olaparib. Um, insurance approval is obtained, but one week later, she has uncontrolled nausea and is thrown up three times. So you wanna make sure she's taking the Olaparib with food, give her scheduled Olanz uh, Ondansetron and uh, Prochlorperazine um, or all of the above. And you know this, I would uh, do all of the above, but the one thing that I would do that's not listed here is give Olanzapine the antipsychotic at 2.5 milligrams at bedtime. I found that to be incredibly helpful for patients who have nausea with Olaparib and it allows them to take less than the uh, recommend, you know, the every single, dose of Olaparib on Dancitron, which gives them constipation and sometimes a headache. So um, it, I found that that works really well. Um, so the next thing are the Natalie trial. We talked about Giridestrin to SIRDs as well as um, other SIRDs actually uh, are going to be luminestrant will be evaluated in the extended adjuvant setting. And I'm sure camazestrant, which just reported in a press release, a positive phase two trial will be evaluated. Uh, Pembro and chemo, of course, there's an adjuvant trial going on and cell-free DNA to evaluate for minimal residual disease. And shared decision-making as we just finished here is important to empower patients to make health-related decisions, to integrate personal preferences with uh, provider guidance. Very, very important. So we've learned a lot today. The backbone of adjuvant treatment is evolving. We're making big advances, a uh, very exciting time. We're trying to evaluate the need for chemotherapy. And I think we're gonna see a lot more uh, genomic criteria as, whether, as well as others in the near future. Adherence is critical um, and management of toxicity is also critical with abemaciclib for high-risk disease and olaparib for patients with germline BRCA1-2 mutations. Now we have our post-test here. Um, I am wondering, can you run through the post-test? Uh, we have, don't forget the claim credit here in the survey monkey that's in the chat. Um, I'm, I might have to, I'm worried that people won't have time to go through the post-test but uh, go ahead and vote. Let's see if we can do it. Quickly. Yes, I can just launch them again. So oh, here we go. If anybody does have any questions and you wanna put them in the Q&A box, we can answer them as we go through these questions. And also if you save them, um, we can answer them at the end too. I'm just gonna have to, I think run, but. Here's question two, please answer. And there is a question in the chat box, Dr. Rugo, if you wanna answer that while I do these questions. The question about understanding differences between CDK4-6 inhibitors complicated due to the differences in survival seen in the metastatic setting and the differences in palbo, et cetera, uh, in the early stage uh, setting. There are some differences in inhibition of CDK4 and 6 uh, between the three different agents. And we don't really understand this completely, but I think we need to use an evidence-based approach um, with the trials that are showing the best outcome driving our treatment. But knowing that in the metastatic setting, all three drugs had identical hazard ratios for PFS. And so tolerance is gonna be a critical decision in giving these drugs. And if it's possible, I'm gonna have you finish up with the uh, questions. I think most people are doing a fabulous job. 